Can baby Pokemon like Pichu, Munchlax, and Mime Jr. conquer the Galar region? These Pokemon are well known for being incredibly weak, so personally, I think we're going to have some massive roadblocks ahead. But before we begin, if you're enjoying the content, be sure to like and subscribe and follow me on Twitch while you're at it. Be sure to view the rules for the challenge and take part in our poll down below in the description. No baby Pokemon are available until we get to the wild area, so upon arriving there, we catch ourselves a Tyrogue and a Budu. Tyrogue is commonly referred to as one of the weaker baby Pokemon out there, not really having a lot of variety in its stats, but Budu can actually be pretty solid if we get some good moves for it. And side note, did anybody else know just how hard it is to catch a baby Pokemon? I had always assumed that they were incredibly easy to catch, but I'm pretty sure Tyrogue was the only baby Pokemon we caught in the wild with some amount of ease. I also tried to get Mime Jr., who can undoubtedly be one of the best team members we have thanks to its base 70 special attack and also being a fairy type to help us handle dragon types, but we need to meet a few requirements first. Let's circle back to this later. On our way to Milo, we discovered Beedee, who was actually quite a bit of a hurdle. His psychic types do an absolute number to us, so we got to level 19, saved up to buy the TR for Sludge Bomb, beat him, and then actually had quite the lucky surprise before arriving in Turfield. I never would have guessed that Pichu would be absolutely obnoxious to obtain in Pokemon Shield, but after catching the static, <laughs> get it, Pikachu in the wild area during a thunderstorm, I spent a crazy amount of time looking for a female Pikachu on Route 4, which only has a 1% encounter rate. After obtaining both, our Pichu ended up being bred with Volt Tackle. Yeah, it turns out that that 1% Pikachu that I caught had a 5% chance of holding a Light Ball. It's too bad that it only works on Pikachu though, because Pichu would have greatly benefited from that. Milo was actually incredibly easy, partially because we had Sludge Bomb on Budu. Gossifleur went down in one hit, but instead of his Eldegoss taking out with multiple max strikes, it went for max overgrowth instead. So thanks to a growth, as well as a lucky poison, we got our first badge. Our next team member is actually just to the east of Turfield on Route 5. By accessing the daycare, a lady will give us a Toxel, and it's got... decent special attack? 54 special attack is alright, but it's got horrible move variety compared to our other teammates, so don't expect us to use it that often. I also made sure to catch two Wobbuffet on Route 5 so that we can breed them and make a wine on. We can't breed them until we get a specific incense, but the incense shop is just the town over, so why not is within reach. And it's actually going to be pretty handy, given that it's got a great set of moves. True, it can never do damage by itself, but its main source of offense is through moves like Counter and Mirror Coat, which I plan to use as much as possible. Nessa can be a bit of a weird fight if we don't play our cards correctly. Goldeen and Aracuda go down relatively easily thanks to Buddy's grass moves, but the minute Dreadnought comes out and goes for a Max Geyser, it's all over for us, since it will outspeed us with Swift Swim. I did go pick up a TR for Energy Ball, since Absorb is just not cutting it anymore, so we might need to take advantage of yet another 90 base power move on Budu, making me feel like she'll be carrying us in certain parts. On our Victoria's attempt, I tried being clever in Destiny Bonding once Dreadnought came out, but I actually did not know that Destiny Bond does not work on Dynamax Pokemon, so uh, egg on my face for that one. <laughs> Thankfully, Budu was able to come in and get us the win thanks to Energy Ball. With Nessa's badge, we're actually able to get our next team member, a Munchlax. And if you've seen my Mystery Dungeon run before, you'd know just how incredible of a Pokemon Munchlax is. Now, if only I could catch it without it literally wiping out my team, that'd be great. I fully plan to use the exact same set we used last time. Rest, Stockpile, Belly Drum once it becomes available, and a Coverage move. On our way to Motostoke for the Fire Gym, I actually totally forgot that we can catch Pseudo Wudo just east of there, so I made sure to catch a male and a female, and bought the Rock Incense from Hullberry, and got ourselves a Bonsly. It had a pretty terrible nature, so I kept on rebreeding until we got a Brave one. Sadly, it doesn't learn Stealth Rock via level up, but we can get it through max raid battles, so I'm hoping that we can find one sooner or later because it's going to help out against Leon's Charizard immensely. Unfortunately, this does mean we're going to need to swap him out for somebody else, and I feel as though you've already seen this coming, but we're getting rid of Toxel. Not only do we already have a Poison and Electric type on our team, Toxel literally just does not get any better moves other than normal moves, so our hardest hitting moves on it are Acid and Nuzzle, but don't you worry everybody, Toxel will soon serve its purpose, just <laughs> you wait. Kabu was actually a lot more intense than I expected. My main goal was to try and save as much of my team as possible for Scorch, so I used Why Not to take care of Ninetales, and then once Why Not fell due to a bad play on my part, Tyroak took it down with a fake out. We did pretty terrible damage to Arcanine thanks to Intimidate, but Ted Danson did some pretty serious damage with Body Slam even when burned. I sent in Bonsly after Scorch came out, and it didn't take its moves as well as I wanted it to, 
but Rock Tomb was our saving grace by lowering Scorch's speed, allowing Pichu and Budu to both outspeed, getting us the win. Once you get your first three badges and reach Hammerlock, you actually unlock the Blizzard Weather in the Wild area, which allows Mime Jr. to spawn in the Rolling Fields. We're roughly double its level, but it's much better than catching two Mr. Mimes in the last route of the game, and then breeding after getting eight badges. But again, we must choose someone to put in our party, and it was another tough decision, but uh, Tyrogue just really was not cutting it, seeing as we don't really have any good fighting type moves. We might have a use for him when we get to the Ice Gym, but it's just not in the cards currently, especially when we can get a Riolu not too far away. The other baby Pokemon that we can get here, actually, is one that we've used before if you've seen my trade-only run. This lady in Hammerlock will give us her Togepi if we trade her a Toxel. See, I told you that Toxel would serve its purpose. Togepi is pretty defensive, so I might use it if we get a chance to, and plus it's a timid nature, which is pretty solid too. Before going to take on Alistair, we caught ourselves a Riolu as well. This is a massive step up for us in terms of fighting type coverage, seeing as Riolu can actually learn some fighting type moves naturally. I decided to put Pichu away for the time being, because we don't really have a need for an electric type in the near future, and its defenses are just so pitifully low. Alistair was pretty easy, all things considered, but Mimikyu could have been a massive threat thanks to its disguise ability. Yamask went down thanks to Budu's energy ball, Mimikyu got poisoned due to Poison Point, followed by being taken down by Why Not's Destiny Bond, Bonsly took out Kurslo with its brand new Sucker Punch, and Munchlax took care of Gengar with Bite. With the Ghost Badge in hand, let's head for Balan Leia. There's a few things I want to do here immediately. Firstly, I fought the woman with a Dottler to get us the Eviolite, boosting our defenses by 50% so long as we're unevolved. Seeing as we're babies, we can use as much help as we can get. I also really want to finish this gym as soon as possible so that we can get the TM for Draining Kiss. Mime Jr. doesn't get a Stab Fairy move until it gets Dazzling Gleam at level 44, so I figured that this could help bridge the gap a little bit. We don't really have too much for fairy types, however. We just have Sludge Bomb on Budu and Metal Claw on Riolu. Opal wasn't too bad, though. Even if we didn't have much for fairy types, the quiz mechanic that she implements into her gym gives us a massive buff just to make this more manageable. Thanks to Mime Jr., Weezing went down to a few Psybeams, Mawile went down to Bonsly, mainly due to it only having Draining Kiss and hereby getting damaged by the Rocky Helmet that we got, Togekiss went down to Bonsly with its newly learned Rock Slide, and G-Max Alchemy went down thanks to Why Not's Mirror Coat. I never thought I'd be using Why Not this much, but it's going to be just as useful as Munchlax once we get Belly Drum. Unfortunately though, <laughs> Mime Jr. does not learn Draining Kiss, so we're stuck till level 44 until we can get Dazzling Gleam. That's fun. Melly took a few attempts, but it's totally fine because it gives me more opportunities to simp for her. We immediately got put into a bad spot when her Frost Moth took Bonsly out with a Bug Buzz, and her other Pokemon like Darmanitan, Ice Q, and Gigantamax Lapras pose massive threats for us too. And yes, you don't need to remind me, I now know that Melanie's Darmanitan has Zen Mode, not Guerrilla Tactics. Real talk, every other time I've played through this game, I've never actually gotten Darmanitan to activate its Zen mode. I've always just took it out in one hit. On our successful run, we actually had some crazy luck. Bonsly was able to take out Frostmoth thanks to tanking a Bug Buzz, and it also took Darmanitan to red health after dodging an Icicle Crash. A quick attack from Riolu didn't quite take it down, but thanks to Icicle Crash missing again, Mime Jr. was able to come out and take it out with a Psybeam. Ice Cube comes out next, and I hit it with as many Psybeams as possible since it won't activate its ability, Ice Face. As Mime Jr. goes down, Munchlax comes out and literally gets frozen. <laughs> but we've set up a few stockpiles, so we're able to survive and take it out with a few Brick Breaks. Gigantamax Lapras comes out, and we're able to stall out all three of its Gigantamax turns, allowing Why Not to come in and take it out with a Mirror Coat. After getting our sixth badge, we can finally acquire the Water Bike and get ourselves our final team member for the run, a Mantike. Even though with the worst nature we could possibly get for it, it has an absolutely insane special defense stat, and if we can find ourselves a third serving of leftovers, that recovery mixed with Aqua Ring will give us tons of health back every turn. Plus, it's finally good to, you know, have some water and flying type coverage. I also explored the wild area to pick up some useful items like the Focus Sash and Assault Vest over by the Lake of Outrage. Marnie gave us no issues outside of Spike Myth, and we were thankfully able to take care of the Dark Gym very easily thanks to our newly acquired Dazzling Gleam on Mime Jr. Thanks to that, Scrafty went down in one shot, Ted Danson and Riolu were able to take down Obstagoon thanks to Brick Break and the Rocky Helmet, and Why Not took out Malamar and and Skun Tank with Counter and Destiny Bond respectively. We also pick up a Choice Specs just past Piers, which we're definitely going to need in the future. Raihan is an absolute nightmare for our team because he takes advantage of weather while also making his battle a double battle. His team has incredible coverage and his Gigantamax Duraludon can raise all of their attack with a Max Knuckle. Every turn in this battle is vital for our success, but we just kept on getting knocked down time and time again. 
Is this really a winnable challenge? Our strategy here <laughs> was a bit odd. We really don't have a lot of coverage for his team, so we actually have to use counter on three Pokemon, Riolu, Bonsly, and Why Not. So in this fight, Flygon hit Riolu and Bonsly with Break and Swipe, allowing us to get a bit of chip damage off with the Rocky Helmet. Gigalith sets up the Stealth Rocks, meaning Bonsly and Riolu's counters both hit Flygon. This has to be the first turn, otherwise we lose. Gigalith will often go for Body Press on Bonsly, but we need as much health as possible for when Sandaconda comes out. With Flygon down, we need to take care of Gigalith. Bonsly can live a Body Press at the current health that it has after Flygon's attack, and thanks to the Rocky Helmet again, Gigalith goes down to a counter. With Sandaconda and his Gigantamax Duraludon out, we need to make sure Duraludon does not raise his attack stat too much. So when Riolu and Bonsly both faint, I immediately switch out to Mantike and Mime Jr. since he'll be more inclined to go for Steel Spike or Rockfall. Unfortunately, he is able to get an attack raise off, but thanks to Why Not using Mirror Coat on Sandaconda after getting hit with an Earth Power and being able to survive a plus one Iron Head, Counter was able to take down Duraludon, awarding us our final Gym Badge. Upon arriving in Winden, we're able to finally get ourselves some great coverage moves in the Elemental Punches, as well as Drain Punch for Riolu. These are going to be our saving graces in the finals, but I'm a bit worried we're going to need to be immensely overleveled for this. Marnie was actually pretty tough, but solely because her Gigantamax Grim Snarl was tough. It does way too much damage to all of our Pokemon, and its G-Max Snooze takes out Why Not in one hit, even with the Eviolite, meaning we can't use Counter to take it down. Now, there's a positive and a negative to this. On the negative side, we need to grind more. On the bright side, she's really high leveled, and this will give us more experience than anything in the wild area. We also had a really big brain strat during this time, because Bonsly can learn counter, which we know from our battle with Raihan, but my good gamer senses were clearly off because I forgot that Bonsly can also get the sturdy ability, which means that we can always live a single hit as long as we're at full health. Now, I'm not good at math, I got a 65 in my differential calculus class and I almost had to retake trigonometry, but strong physical attacker plus sturdy plus counter equals easy win. Only downside to this is that we have to breed a brand new Bonsly. Ironically, on our victorious attempts, we didn't even need it because why not was able to tank a G-Max Snooze with 4 HP. Hop was easy as usual, but he just took a while to set up. His double couldn't really do too much damage to us, so we set up with Ted Danson completely to have three stockpiles, and we also maximized our attack with Belly Drum. Dubwool, Pinkurchin, Snorlax, Corviknight, and Inteleon all went down with ease, but surprisingly, Corviknight and Inteleon lived the first hit. I've learned my mistakes from my last fight with Oleana, so I made sure to put both Fire Punch and Thunder Punch on Munchlax. Frostlass unfortunately burned us and set up a lot of double teams, but we were safely able to rest when Milotic came out since it doesn't have any way to deal a status effect to us. After Milotic goes down, Salazzle takes us dangerously low, thanks to poisoning us and then critting us with Venoshock, which doubles in power when the target's poisoned. We took it down, but I completely forgot about Serena, but thankfully she went down to an Ice Punch from Riolu. Gigantamax Garboder comes out and takes out Bonsly, but we are able to get some serious damage off due to countering her Max Quake. Why not finish it off shortly after? We beat BD on our first attempt, but good god did this start off terribly. He starts off with a Mawile, which we can easily kill with Bonsly living with Sturdy and then countering, but of course, he went for Iron Head and flinched us. Thankfully, Munchlax came in and finished off Mawile, Gardevoir, and Galarian Rapidash, while Why Not came out to Mirror Coat his Gigantamax Hattery. This was actually a bit of a risky move, seeing that G-Max Smite confuses whoever it hits, but thankfully we broke through. I definitely went into Nessa's fight a bit cocky, since I was just planning to do the same strat we did in our Mystery Dungeon run, setting up against Sea King and getting Golisopod off the field as soon as possible. But first impression does way too much, and our Thunder Punch does way too little. It took two Thunder Punches just to activate Emergency Exit, but by the time Sea King comes out, we have way too little health and Munchlax gets taken down. We are able to get the Gigantamax Dreadnought, but we did not do much damage. But look at this second attempt at Nessa, because it is one of the craziest battles that I have had in my life. So obviously she starts off with her Golisopod, but sets up two Swords Dances. I tried being clever and protecting on the first turn, expecting her to go for a first impression, but Liquidation takes out Munchlax in one hit. We were able to get one Thunder Punch off, but our best bet was going into Bonsly since it's guaranteed to live any hit. However, due to the Rocky Helmet, Galisopod gets below half health, hereby activating its Emergency Exit ability, switching out into Barrascuta, 
resulting in it getting taken out by Counter. After going back into Golisopod, it takes out Bonslide, but she heals as we go into Budu. Thanks to some energy balls, we can send it back to half health without taking any damage, activating emergency exit again as she sends out Pelipper. She spends a lot of time roosting and setting up Tailwind, but thanks to that roost, energy ball becomes super effective since flying types lose their flying typing. So it went down thankfully to a lucky poison as well. I don't know why she didn't just go for air slash at all there, but I'll take it. Seeking's out next, but we stay in and take it out thanks to her setting up an aqua ring and almost taking us out with a mega horn. Golisopod comes out again and takes us out with first impression as I send in Riolu to try and take it out with a quick attack. Clearly it didn't, but Riolu somehow managed to live a liquidation with 1 HP without any kind of friendship bonus. We then get a crit on our final quick attack, resulting in Mime Jr. coming out and taking it out with Sucker Punch. But as Dreadnought Gigantamaxes, I forgot that it had Max Darkness, and we lost because it swept us. That was a crazy battle, and I know for a fact I will never be able to recreate something like that, ever. On our victorious attempt, I decided to add Mantike and give it the choice specs to activate its emergency exit as soon as possible. Don't ask why I didn't have this idea earlier. As predicted, Air Slash brings Glycepod to half health as she sends out Barrascuta. We decided to use Why Not to take it out with Counter, but then I missed what she was going into next, so assuming she went into Glycepod, I went into Mantike again, but she sends out Sea King. Air Slash was able to take it out, but she actually heals us up with Waterfall before it faints, resulting in Pelipper coming out. Pelipper takes out Mantike, but its moves can't hurt Munchlax too much, so we set up against it and the rest is history. Pelipper, Golisopod, and Dreadnought go down with ease. Alistair was pretty easy, but what I thought would be a big brain play ended up proving that I should not have my master's degree. He starts off with a Dusk Noir, so I decided to use Bonsley to counter any damage he might dish out to me. But you might have realized that fighting moves don't work on ghost types, so that's a wasted effort. We did deal some damage to it thanks to the Rocky Helmet, but the next turn we went for Sucker Punch, but it failed because he went for Disable, disabling Sucker Punch. <laughs> so things were not going my way at the start of this battle, but thankfully Dusk Noir went down to Buddy's Energy Ball, and Chandelure was out next. It can't do anything to Munchlax, so this was the perfect opportunity to set up Stockpiles and Belly Drum, and then we swept through everything else, Chandelure, Pultigeist, Kursla, and Gigantamax Gengar with Bite. Despite how difficult Raihan was before, he's a lot easier now, thanks to being in a singles format. He starts off with Torkoal to set up the sun, and we use Mantike to hit it with Scalds. Granted, it does get weakened by the sun, but Torkoal has body press, and I didn't want to risk him going for that on Munchlax. Torkoal goes down after a few Scalds, and we send in Munchlax as he goes out for Gudra. It does lower our accuracy with Muddy Water, but we're able to take out Gudra and Turtonator, with Stomping Tantrums. We had to switch out because Flygon has Levitate, meaning it's immune to ground moves, but Flygon went down to a counter from Why Not after crunching and setting up a Sandstorm. Duraludon took some time to take down, but thanks to Bonsly and his Rocky Helmet again, Duraludon went down to a counter after losing its Gigantamax form. It seems me being cocky gets me nowhere, seeing as I expected to have an easy time with Rose, yet he gave us some issues as well. Escavalier does a ton of damage with Megahorn, and aside from Riolu, Munchlax, and Bonsly with Brick Break, we really don't have a lot of good answers to his steel types, and seeing as his Kling Clang has Gear Grind, we can't even use Bonsly to counter that since it hits twice, breaking our Sturdy. Unfortunately, he took multiple attempts, but I kid you not, the victorious attempt was probably the stupidest thing I ever considered, yet it worked. <laughs> Ultimately, Munchlax takes too much damage from Megahorn, so obviously the solution should be to either get higher defense or more speed. So we did. I picked up the Choice Scarf by doing the side quest in Hammerlock, while also getting the Choice Band just to the right of Professor Magnolia's house, and we slapped the Choice Scarf on Munchlax. Yeah. Choice Scarf Munchlax is the strat that I'm trying to go for. With this, we were actually able to outspeed and take out a Scavalier, Ferrothorn, and Kling Clang, but Perserker got taken down with Riolu thanks to its Choice Band and Mantike, and Bonsly and Why Not took down Kaparaja. I was genuinely terrified about this battle against Leon, because his entire team hits tremendously hard, and we have to be very specific about who to use when, especially with his Gigantamax Charizard. One wrong move can very easily spell the end for this battle, especially since half of our team is like 10 levels below his. He starts off with Aegislash first, and we start off with Why Not in order to use Mirror Coat on it. Aegislash thankfully doesn't have a lot of HP, and thanks to the Evulite, we were able to survive a Shadow Ball and take it out. But then he sends out Dragapult, who has all special moves and does absolutely nothing to Munchlax, so we send him out, set up some stockpiles and a Belly Drum, rest off any statuses or damage we might have had, 
and we swept the rest of his team with Ice Punch. I am honestly amazed that we beat that on our first attempt, because that battle went exactly how we needed it to go in order for us to succeed. And because of that, we have successfully conquered the Galar region with only baby Pokemon. This was a ton of fun to do. I knew it would be possible because of Munchlax, but I had an absolute blast playing through this, and I hope you guys enjoyed watching it as well. I know I'm not doing the final hop battle, but I want to get this video out as soon as possible so that I can do as many challenge runs as I can before Scarlet and Violet come out. If you enjoyed the video though, be sure to like the video, comment who you think I should have used more down below, and subscribe for more videos. And be sure to follow me on Twitch, as we'll be streaming challenge runs over there every Sunday and Tuesday at 6pm Eastern Standard Time. See you guys in the next one for Pokemon Shield with only Delmines.